in the right place. This is the Eat Fluencer Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Maggie Landis. Together, we are going to unpack everything about eating and discover the what, when, and how that will let you lead your best life. This is not your doctor's conversation about nutrition. Today is when you can start to love eating again. Let food be food and you be you. Get ready to get eat fluenced. Welcome back, everyone, to the Eat Fluencer podcast. I'm Maggie Landis. And I'm hoping most of y'all are repeat listeners by this point, but if you are happening upon this podcast for the first time right now, uh, I am a physician and public health nutritionist who now exclusively is working in the non-diet space as a health at every size advocate, educator, speaker, and really my mission is to take weight care out of healthcare for everybody. So you're listening to episode 72 right now. We are in season two of this podcast and we're talking today about food tracking. Um, This is something I think has a universal, you know, thread. We all have tracked food. If you have done even one diet, you have been accustomed to logging and recording everything you ate. And we're going to talk about, is that totally a absolute no-go when you're leaving diet culture? Or are there some specific circumstances where it might even be useful? We're going to talk about that and which circumstances those are. But before we get into the content for this week, uh, I have to tell you that my brand new free training uh, is live. I, I think last week I told you it was um, almost ready, but it is ready. It is live. You can sign up and do this one hour free training anytime. This is um, designed for health professionals that are um, curious, interested, um, even cynical about the weight neutral approach to care. Uh, I know if you're listening to this podcast, you're thinking that maybe there is something gained when we leave diet culture out of the exam room with our patients and our clients. But we are trained to weigh everybody. We are trained to measure BMIs. We are trained to use weight loss as a health metric and maybe we don't have to do that anymore. And and a lot of health professionals, um, perhaps even some of you listening, are in this space where you're not sure what it would look like to leave the scale out of it. Like you just can't imagine the logistics or the um, dialogue or the recommendations, the, you know, the assessments without weight and BMI being part of it. That's what this training helps you answer. Um, It is basically how to break up with the BMI, which in my mind is the very first step in adopting a complete weight neutral uh, health practice. But we have to start with the scale because it, it is continuing to hold us back and really is just the ball and shackle, you know, that is keeping us uh, stuck in diet culture and perpetuating diet culture with our patients and clients and uh, the weight bias that occurs, um, whether you're a doctor, physical therapist, a dietitian, a nutritionist, a health coach, chiropractor, any kind of health professional, if we're going to really provide the most ethical, most evidence-based model of care, it's got to be from a weight inclusive standpoint. And this workshop is the first step how to do that. All right. All the links are in the show notes, uh, or you can find them easily on my website, in my Instagram bio, anywhere. Okay. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you there for the training. So let's get into today's episode. All right. Tracking everything we eat. This feels like one of the 10 commandments of diet culture. 
Note to self, I should do a whole episode about the Ten Commandments of Diet Culture. But uh, it really is something we are all accustomed to doing. Like I said, if you have done even one diet for one day, you know it involves recording everything you do. And it looks a lot of different ways, but it's all just the wolf in sheep's clothing. It is... It is diet culture. It is a tool of diet culture. It is um, a method of uh, distraction and oppression and judgment. It, uh, the way that we're using it now is not good for us. Now, spoiler alert, uh, a little further in this episode, I'm going to tell you three times when food tracking may be helpful um, as you're leaving diet culture. And I'm going to talk about who would benefit and how they can apply it in a non-diet way. But we're going to get to that. First, let's talk about this diet culture food logging that we're doing right now. What does it look like? Okay, well, there's there's one kind of unusual uh, thing. I call it perspective tracking or forward tracking. Um, Now, I'm not talking about menu planning or meal planning or food prepping or anything. That is, that's not tracking. That is just planning your grocery list and your week so that you can like organize your meals in an efficient way for your family. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this forward food tracking. Um, If you're familiar with Corinne Crabtree and her No BS Woman program, this is how she teaches diet culture is basically pre-planning what you're going to eat, writing it down exactly. I mean, exactly what you're going to eat and then being 100% compliant with that plan. So she teaches her, um, her clients uh, and her audience like to diet by planning 24 hours ahead. And she, uh, tell, excuse me, tells them, you know, the evening before plan out what you're eating for the next 24 hours down to the food items that you're going to have and then stick to it. And that's it. You don't modify the plan the next day. There is no, like changing or swapping or, oh, well, I did something off my plan. So then tomorrow I'll revise my plan. It is just straight up compliance with your own planning. Um, so that's sort of this like forward tracking. And I don't know too many people that do that outside of her and her program. That's how she teaches. But most people are more familiar with this retrospective or backtracking where you eat and then track what you've eaten. And even within that, there's a lot of different ways, um, most of which you have probably practiced. So you can track meals, okay? And what this looks like is you eat lunch and then you either write down or record or put in your app or whatever, you know, half a ham sandwich, baby carrots and a chocolate chip cookie, okay? You write that down. There's portion tracking. So your lunch would look like this. Three ounces of ham, two slices of white bread, two tablespoons of light mayonnaise, nine baby carrots, and one two-inch diameter chocolate chip cookie. Okay, that's based on like weights and measurements. There's calorie tracking um, where you just add everything up and say your lunch was 650 calories, for example. Um, you know, and this, this really goes off the rails when it's paired with an exercise tracker, because that, you know, is this reductionist idea that, uh, our body is an algebra problem where we eat and we exercise and there's a net balance. And that is how we, you know, modify the size of our body, which is not at all how the human body works. And that's a whole other conversation, but, um, calorie tracking is really common, in these apps that also measure exercise because they like to put that in a real linear algorithm. Then there's um, macro tracking. 
Okay, and if you've done keto diet, then you are familiar with macros. Macro meaning macronutrients. So that's protein, carbohydrates, and fat. There are three macronutrients. That is it. There's no magic. It's just that's the the word they use is macro tracking. And so your lunch might look like 22 grams of protein, 45 grams of carbs, 14 grams of fat. All right. There are um, some variations on a theme I've heard of recently where there's, there's apps. And I think, honestly, I think even Noom does this with their clients, if I'm not mistaken, kind of like a photo tracking where you literally take a picture of your plate and then that's your photo record. It's like photojournalism of your food, but it's not like, you know, Instagram photos. It's like keeping it all in this um, record. And I guess if you have a coach or something they're you're sharing it with them so they can judge what you have on your plate. But, um, that's another thing people have done. And that's, that's still tracking. (laughs) Okay. Even if it's pretty pictures, that is still food tracking. And then there's, um, I don't know what to call it. Mega tracking, totally over the top, like the tracking of the Maximus Trachimus. This is when, you are recording calories, portions, unsaturated fat, saturated fat, uh, sugar, added sugar, carbohydrates, um, fiber, the protein, all the micronutrients, you know, the like that's basically a food label detail, um, maybe even more so than that. And you're keeping track of all of that. Now I, was trained to do that when I got my master's degree in, in nutrition, the, one of the nutrition classes we took, we had to actually do this kind of a food log for ourselves for, I think it was for five days or something. Total insanity. (laughs) Okay. Total insanity. Because I mean, if you eat a packaged food, that's actually as easy as it gets this, I believe tracking food like this actually encourages people to eat packaged foods, which I have nothing against packaged foods, but I don't think that's like the best, easiest way to learn how to intuitively eat is by only eating things with labels because it's the only way you can get this amount of granular information. I mean, it's just heinous. I remember taking this class and spending like more than an hour a day literally looking up everything. If it wasn't, you know, like I said, didn't have a label on it. I had to basically figure out how much I ate or do this crazy documentation and like research project to figure out what I ate for five days. And it's just, um, there's no, there's no utility in that. Honestly, this was a terrible exercise in my, in my master's program. And it's a terrible exercise if you're doing this every day of your life. So point of all that, There's a lot of ways tracking, food tracking looks, all right? In Texas, we say there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, (laughs) but they are all tools of diet culture when they are done this way. Um, The common denominator is that they are inflexible. They are intellectual. So you have reduced the act of eating to its nutritional components. And that is the only value that you see in the process of eating. It is often impractical and unrealistic, um, specifically the forward tracking or this perspective tracking, like how Korean Crabtree does. I mean, just the idea of having zero flexibility. So you plan what you're eating tomorrow and then when everything goes off the rails and you get called into work late or, you know, whatever happens, like it's basically a complete no excuses, um, very rigid way to approach food tracking. Um, another commonality between all these ways is that it's measuring against a quote normal. There's like some sort of benchmarking because why would we be recording every single gram of unsaturated fat and fiber and everything if there wasn't some number or measurement we were aiming for? Like there's always a normal that we're comparing ourselves against. And, you know, the idea in 
leaving diet culture behind and adopting a non-diet approach to eating and food is that it is a one size fits one approach. And so we are getting rid of normals and regular amounts and we're getting rid of ideal weights and we're getting rid of uh, appropriate portion sizes. A lot of air quotes here. Okay. Um, because that's not reading our body. That's reading some external source. And we don't, we don't want to eat and exist like that. Plus the other thing that these things, all, all these tracking, uh, situations have in common, serious use of time, effort, brain power, super distracting, super complex, emphasizes this overthinkingness, scrutinizing mindset about food. Um, and it really takes the experience of eating out of you and hands over your autonomy to some sort of external guide, whether that's a, a book or a program or an app or a person. Um, that's not intuitive eating. That's not a natural naturally occurring relationship with food. Um, and you have to remember too, this is not, I'm not just railing on this because I'm trying to like stick it to the man and, you know, watch Noom go bankrupt or something. I am telling you this because when you subscribe to such a rigid framework, you are increasing your chronic stress. Even if it's a low level, you have this undercurrent baseline chronic stress that is caused by your obsession with this food tracking. And besides the time it takes up, besides the distraction of your mind and your mental space, chronic stress increases cortisol. It increases adrenaline. It increases your blood pressure. It increases your blood sugar. It interferes with your sleep and your serotonin and your mood and all these things that we're trying to micromanage and fix with food, but it is doing absolutely the opposite when we, um, you know, relate to food in, in such a rigid, objective way. All right. We want to decrease stress to increase our health. And this trachophilia food logging obsession we have is doing the exact opposite. So, are there any circumstances when I think food tracking is useful once you're, you know, exiting diet culture? And I thought of three, all right? I want to share these three with you. Um, two of them are very specific, very sort of small groups of people that probably most of you do not fit into, but the third one might. So, I'm going to go through these first two pretty quickly, and then we'll talk about the third one that I think is a little more widely applicable. Early eating disorder recovery. Okay, number one, early eating disorder recovery. When you have an eating disorder, depending on the severity of the eating disorder and the length of time that you've been struggling with that, uh, it is a common thing for the body's connection to the mind in terms of hunger and fullness cueing for that connection to be disrupted uh, and disrupted to the point where really, truly you can't rely on your own biologic signals for a period of time until they are resurrected. All right. It, it Having an eating disorder and recovering from an eating disorder does not mean that they are gone, that those signals are permanently absent, that they're extinguished completely. It just means that Sometimes they are so dialed down or buried, you, you have to actively re-engage your sort of biopsychological uh, tracks in terms of uh, food and eating and hunger and fullness. So the purpose of food tracking and eating disorder recovery is to make sure you're eating enough when you can't rely on the hunger and fullness cues. It is not to restrict. It is not to judge and measure and objectify the food. It is to have a 
objective outside professional third party, okay, to make sure you're getting enough nutrition in recovery. It's a super slippery slope to tell an eating disorder patient to track food. So I am not at all recommending that you do this outside of the boundaries of a supervised, well-monitored, time-limited, comprehensive treatment plan with a professional. But I think it has some use in that specific circumstance. Okay, the number two circumstance that applies to a small group of people is elite athletes. Now, I know when I use the word elite and athlete, that actually has a specific meaning in many sports. And I'm not talking about necessarily elite as a label for an athlete. I'm just, I don't really even know what that means. Clearly, I'm not an elite athlete. But I'm talking about people that are pushing the boundaries of the absolute physical limits of the human body. I'm not talking about the average fitness buff. I'm not talking about the sort of normal person going to the gym to exercise. I'm not talking about people, you know, that are uh, sort of social runners or anything like that. I'm talking about people who uh, are essentially fitness, you know, their their work is their body. And um, the purpose of this This is kind of ditto with the eating disorder patients. And I should also say eating disorders are super, super common in this elite athlete group of people. And so that is kind of why it's hand in hand. There needs to be a lot of screening and eating disorder prevention going on in this group because they are very high risk. Um, But the purpose of food tracking with elite athletes is to make sure they're getting enough. It's not to limit the intake. I mean, these are people that are using such a humongous amount of energy that if they don't get the right nutrition and the, the necessary amount of nutrition, they can like permanently damage their organs and stuff. Okay. Which is way beyond just like me going to the gym for 40 minutes a few times a week. Okay. Um, and this needs to happen with supervision. These athletes should be working with a multidisciplinary team, a training team. There should be somebody that is a specialist in nutrition, whether it's a, a physician who's been trained to do it, a um, dietitian, a sports nutritionist. Uh, there really is a lot of nuance to nourishing this group of people and doing the eating disorder prevention and screening that needs to be done too. So, uh, you know, like I said, okay, eating disorder recovery, elite athletes. Most of you are probably not either of those. The third reason that I do think some tracking can be helpful, big red asterisk, is when you are really early in your journey with intuitive eating. But, big capital but, it has to be done in a very modified way, okay? Not the tracking that we talked about above. Okay. Not the, um, the calories and the macros and the portion measurements, not that, that is diet culture tracking hands down. Um, intuitive eating food tracking or, or logging is about understanding why you choose a food and how your body responded to it in that circumstance and how that may affect your decision making in the future. And it is not about numbers. It is not about measurements and portions and numbers. It is a kind of subjective narrative tracking. And you can either... Uh, If you want to experiment around with this, here's how I recommend you do it. Either literally write out a narrative, okay, or dictate it into a note in your phone or come up with some sort of color coding system or some of your, some shorthand or something that's non-numerical, non-numerical, no weights, no measures, no calories, none of that sort of stuff. We're talking about, like when we talked about earlier about this ham sandwich lunch, this is what and for example, you might record, okay, uh, had a short lunch break at work, was busy, had to grab and go in the cafeteria, 
had half a ham sandwich, some carrots, and a cookie. Hungry two hours later, needed a snack. You know, in the future, same situation, might add a yogurt or a piece of cheese with my lunch so I don't uh, need a snack so early in the afternoon. Okay, something like that. That's that's a little wordy, but you get my point, is that it's it's not talking about the composition of what I I ate. It's talking about why I chose it, how I felt after I ate it, and how knowing those two things would help me make another decision. So it's not judgmental. It's not analytical. It has to be objective. It really is a information gathering introspective exercise. Uh, Notice it's not compared to a benchmark, okay? There's no, quote, too much or too little or more than I should or, um, you know, overeating or any any sort of commentary like that because we're not judging ourselves. We are just um, viewing what happened and without judgment, making a decision on how to connect better with our hunger and fullness and our food choices in the future. That's it. Now, here's the deal. If you're doing food logging in an intuitive eating way, you shouldn't have to do it all the time, okay? If you feel like every single thing you eat must be recorded, that's diet culture, okay? Diet culture is inflexible and requires every piece of data at every single intersection, okay? This kind of food tracking is when you need to sort of assess something specific, it's information to gain so that if you have a specifically bad or good physical or emotional response to a particular food choice, then there's something to learn and that's the value in it. Not just to write it down because you have a pencil to write it down, okay? And you shouldn't have to do it all the time. Like I said, the compulsory nature of food tracking is a diet culture compulsion. This should be okay to be intermittent because guess what? Not every single time you put food in your mouth is a learning opportunity. It's just not that special all the time. Um, And we need to understand that sometimes we eat and we don't feel particularly good or bad and it's not magical and it's just food and we move on and there's no need to make a mountain out of a molehill when there is nothing to be gained from that. All right. Um, But if you're learning and you're still practicing this uh, information, internal information gathering exercise, this could be useful in some situations when it's done in this way intermittently. Okay. Was that enough asterisk? (laughs) That's like the biggest caveat footnote I've ever put on a podcast, but, um, I challenge you. Okay. I'm going to challenge you to stop tracking. Okay. Unless you're in eating disorder recovery, unless you're an elite athlete and you're being supervised by an informed non-diet nutrition specialist, okay, the few of you, great. You can go to your care team and talk about this. But um, if you are, you know, all by yourself trying to learn intuitive eating um, and get away from diet culture... Just challenge yourself to stop tracking, get rid of the apps, delete Noom, delete my fitness pal, get rid of the food journal that you're carrying around in your purse or whatever. And then notice, I'm, I'm a big fan of just cold Turkey stuff. You know, as a side note, you guys know that I've, I am a believer in just stop dieting, just stop weighing yourself, just stop tracking, like rip the bandaid off and let's deal with it instead of trying to like pussyfoot tiptoe into some you know, new way of life. I just think it's too, too tempting to go back when you're still halfway sitting there. So, um, I'm a fan of just straight up not tracking and notice what it feels like. If you are somebody who's tracking your food now, just don't do it. 
for a week or two if you can and see what it feels like okay and be objective and be neutral but really be honest do you are you picking things that you enjoy eating more because now you're making the decision and not some prescribed food plan are you less distracted and more present and mindful with the food and the people that you're eating with and the environment you're eating in because you don't have to like record everything on the food label and take pictures and try to memorize stuff for later uh, when you have to type it into your app or something. Do you feel like you sense hunger and fullness a little better when you're basing it off of yourself and not off of some external cue? Um, Hopefully you're recognizing this increased confidence in your ability to do this over time maybe there's less guilt at the end of the day because uh, I mean I remember being in diet culture and thinking like oh I'm not doing too bad oh I'm not doing too bad lots of air quotes too bad too bad that's all judging and then you get to the end of the day and you look at your thing and you've gone over the thing and the little green check mark turned to a red x and then tomorrow is I mean there's so much stress and anxiety and guilt and just um wrapped up in the recording everything we eat life is so much better outside of doing that outside of diet culture and and the um, reduction in your stress around food and around eating has both psychological and physical benefits and I want you to experience those benefits all right so that's my challenge for this week stop the tracking or switch over to an intuitive eating uh, narrative tracking model and let me know how it goes. I'm very curious. Now, also, I want to say one more time, uh, like I did at the top of the session, if you are a health professional and want to learn the very first step in adopting a weight neutral practice model for yourself, and you do, like you do want to establish a weight neutral practice model, if you're not already doing it, because that is the most evidence-based ethical way to treat patients and clients in the health professions, period, full stop. The first step is breaking up with the BMI and the scale. And I have a free training that is now live that can teach you how to do that in one hour. It's the first step towards this weight neutrality. And um, it's free. The link is in the show notes. One hour, several times you can choose from to watch at your convenience. Um, If you sign up for a session and you happen to miss it, yes, there's a replay. Uh, I really, really hope you'll consider committing an hour of your time to learn about this. It will change everything. It will change everything, okay? Look forward to continuing your conversation here on the Influencer Podcast too. So connect with me, leave me a rating and review, um, drop me a DM and let me know what topics you'd like to hear in upcoming episodes. Uh, I love um, feeling like we are a community, that you're not just a bunch of listeners and I'm not the talking head. Uh, I really you know, started this podcast with the idea of bringing people to this non-diet way of life. And, um, it takes a lot of different, uh, working a lot of different angles to do that. And I'm happy to serve. I'm glad that you're here with me today and we'll talk uh, next Wednesday. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for being here today. If you love what you've learned, follow me on social media at Maggie Landis MD, and you'll never miss a thing. You can also check out my website at maggielandismd.com and sign up to be part of our community of eaters. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk again soon.